Hello, closers. Welcome to Tuesdays with Hoffman. Literally Tuesdays with Hoffman, as you can see. Cece's nowhere around, and we miss her terribly, but she is on a much-deserved overdue vacation. Uh, unfortunately, that generally means that uh, I'm like a chicken with my head cut off. And I think we were having some audio issues with Zoom when we were doing the promo. If you could just type into the chat, let us know. You can hear the, the audio, okay? That'd be great. But hello, hello. I am so thrilled for this Tuesdays. Um, although I miss Cece terribly. I know you guys do too. But it, what it did was it gave me the opportunity to hijack this half hour for something I've wanted to do pretty much since the season started. Um, this, this topic around mastery is something that I generally reserve for our private classes and our private workshops um, with the folks that are uh, members of the Closer community or, or those who are our corporate clients. And there's something about this particular um, topic, and as you'll see, and where we are kind of and all the things going on around us that I just thought, this is just such a perfect thing to explore and to share with you guys. It's a life changer. Uh, it was a life changer for me. It's been a life changer for my friends and family, for my children, and frankly, anyone I've ever shared this with. Uh, it's not, I don't know if I'm an author, if I stole it, if I borrowed it. Um, you'll definitely hear elements in this that are pretty common in theories around mastery, and I'll point out the things that I kind of changed along the way. Um, but what happened was I, I discovered something I don't know, like 10, 15 years ago, uh, one of the joys I have is that uh, in addition to what I do for a living, I do a lot of work with kids and I do teaching. Uh, I do different things that I teach and coach with children, obviously not sales. And um, one of the things I noticed pretty quickly is, oh my God, it's so much easier to teach children than it is to teach adults. And I'm sure most of you are nodding your head saying, well, yeah, it is. But like, why? Because theoretically, it shouldn't be. Theoretically, it should be much easier to teach an adult because an adult has experience, not just experience in doing things, but experience in learning. You know, we all learned, start to learn at an early age. The idea that as I get older, why am I getting to be a worse student? That always really bothered me, that children seem to be a lot quicker with failure and defeat in the learning process than adults are. And it really got to me because it was like, because, you know, I look in a mirror, I'm an adult and I struggle with learning sometimes. Um, so what, what I'm about to share with you is, a, is really a theory on why this is, but more importantly, something we can use to our favor to really break through this, the shackles that keep us from learning new things and getting better as we age. We tend to like have this learning curve where we're all about drinking in all the learning around us and then one day we wake up and we're all good, and here's the way I always say it. There's something that every one of us has done throughout our lives, something we've done daily, sometimes hourly. We did it every day, we did it every week, we did it every month, we did it every season, we did it every year. We did it when we were four, we did it when we were six, we did it when we were eight, we did it when we were 13. And then some point, maybe at 18 or 21, we stopped doing this, and we never do it again. What is this thing? It's practice. Practice is a normal thing for kids. It's a normal part of their day. But somewhere as adults, it stops becoming a normal part of our day. And generally because we feel like, oh, we got it. If I learn it, I don't have to practice it. If I can nod my head in understanding, that's enough. But in reality, it really isn't enough. So I'm gonna tell a little story um, that I think you're gonna like, that kind of illustrates this before we get into the meat uh, of this technique. Um, this is about 10 years ago. Uh, my wife and I and our kids, we do a lot of skiing living here in New England. And one year we're going up to Maine to do some skiing and my oldest son, who was a teenager at the time, uh, was in the back seat and he said, hey dad, I think I might wanna try snowboarding this, this, this vacation. Um, all my friends snowboard and I kind of want to try it. Now he'd been downhill skiing and that's all I do. Um, so I was like, yeah, whatever you want to do, buddy. Yeah, you can definitely, we'll get you some gear. And he's like, cool. And I said, uh, as I'm driving, hey, do you, you want to take a lesson or should I just get you the gear and you'll mess around? Now, now my son's really thoughtful. So he usually waits a while before he answers my questions. And he's thinking about it and he goes, yeah, I think I'd like to do a lesson. I was like, oh, no problem, man. We'll set it up when we get to the mountain. Um, hey, would you mind if I joined you? because I've never snowboarded either, and that might be fun, and I wouldn't mind trying it. Could I take a lesson with you? And my son's like, yeah, Dad, definitely, no problem. It'd be fun. I'm like, cool, and I'm driving, thinking, oh, this will be great. My wife's next to me like this. This is a horrible idea, and she's right, as you'll see. So we get to the mountain, we get our gear, 
we get our nice instructor, just a nice uh, young woman, and me and my son on the top of a little hill, and we're starting with our snowboard lesson. And guess what? It's impossible. I've been skiing for, at that point, 40 years. What's my expectation? My expectation is what? I bet it's like your expectation. I probably won't master snowboarding in this 45 minute lesson, but I bet I'll be okay. I bet I'll figure out a way to get down the hill. And what am I basing this impression or this theory on? I ski and I've skied for a while. Plus I'm pretty smart. Plus I'm dedicated to learn, I'm all focused and, and I'm in front of my son, I wanna be credible. So all these things are in my favor where I bet I'll figure this out in an hour. Did I? Uh, no. Let's put it this way, I, it took me half the first 45 minutes to even figure out how to get my feet in and out of the bindings. It's like impossible to move when you've got this big snowboard locked to your foot. Um, I'll tell you something else too. When you ski, you get a little heads up when you wipe out, like catch an edge or something. You, you get this little like, you know you're about to wipe out and you can kind of kind of grimace and kind of like brace or whatever. Snowboarding, no warning, bam, bam. Every time you fall, bam, brutal. And every time I fell, Right here, right on my ass. Same two places every single time. I hated it. And I was doing miserably. But what's interesting is what was happening to my mood. I'm sure you guessed it. It was deteriorating quickly. I was starting to get angry. I was starting to get angry at the equipment. This is stupid, why is it built this way? I was starting to get angry at the conditions. It's really icy here. We should be doing this somewhere else. I was getting frustrated with the instructor. She's talking too fast or I need her to watch me do this but ultimately, who was I really getting angry at? I was getting angry at myself. What's wrong with me? It's frustrating, and the longer we went, the madder I got. Now, how's my son doing? Well, type it in the chat. How do you think my son's doing? You think he's doing better or worse than me? Type it in. Yeah, 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 better, better, killing it, better for sure, better for sure. You're all wrong. You're all dead wrong. You're dead wrong. You've he was worse than I was. At least I had experienced skiing for 40 years. He didn't. He was as miserable physically as I was. He was falling all over himself, dusting himself off. He was as lousy at snowboarding as I was, but he didn't appear to be frustrated. That was a difference. If that's what you meant by better, I give you that. He wasn't frustrated. All right, whatever, we finished the lesson. And by the end of this lesson, I had taken the snowboard off and I was now walking with my son down to the lodge to get lunch with my other son and my wife. And as we walked in to get lunch, oh, you can imagine, you know, I had that look on my face that my wife's seen many times. And she's like, oh my God, let me guess. And I was like, hey, it was horrible. And I started talking about how horrible it was and people were laughing. I said, in fact, honey, when I'm done eating, I'm just gonna jet out of here, get my skis. I need to be alone for a couple hours. I need to get my juices back and just do some skiing. So I had realized at that moment, I was probably never gonna snowboard again. And, and by the way, I haven't. I haven't snowboarded again. But here's the $100 question. I realized as I was going on at lunch about how miserable I was, I hadn't asked Charles what he thought. I assumed he had the same experience because he was as bad as I was. I said, hey, Charles, what'd you think of that? And again, he's quiet and he's thoughtful when he answers. So we went, yeah, I try that again. Yeah, I'd try that again. Hmm. Think about it for a second, guys. You know why my son wasn't so put off at stinking in a 45 minute snowboard lesson? Unlike his father, who's an adult, he had no expectations of performance or mastery. Nothing in my son's head thought, I am gonna be a kick-ass snowboarder in 45 minutes. I am certain of that because he was a teenager. And when you're a teenager or a kid, guess what? Most of your day is stinking at things. <laughs> I mean, everything is new when you're a kid. You're always learning fractions or how to balance yourself on a bicycle or play a musical instrument or interact with a colleague. You're, you're, everything's new learning. So falling and hitting your forehead, that's a Tuesday for a kid, but not for a 45 year old adult. Because at some point, we, we stop practicing, we stop learning that way, and we just do what we've already learned. So what was very interesting in that moment, it was a big eye opener for me when my son had that reaction. And that brings us, I'm gonna show you exactly what happened here. So I'm gonna queue up a graphic for you to take a look at. I'm gonna show you exactly what happened and what happens to all of us as we attempt to master something. If you look at this, great, it, this might look familiar to you. I, again, I kind of stole it, kind of used it, kind of borrowed it. And you're looking at four quadrants or four circles in this case that go 
uh, counterclockwise, starts at UI and works its way around. What do these letters mean? What does all this stuff mean? Okay. The theory behind this on how we master a skill is that we have to master it through two avenue, avenues in ourself, the brain and the hands. There has to be cognitive understanding and there has to be acumen or skill. Understanding lives in the brain and the mind and the delivery and the actual delivery of the technique or of what you're mastering lies in the fingers. And hopefully in a perfect world, they match and they ride along together in their learning journey. But as we learn very quickly and have studied and know, the brain and the mind as well, versus the hand learn differently, learn at different speeds, learn at different rates. But it does impact how we perceive what's happening. Let's look at that first circle. It says UI. UI means unconscious, incompetent. The first letter refers to the brain and the second letter refers to the hand. This is not about a person, by the way. This is about a skill, meaning that all of us live in one of these circles in hundreds of things. I've got dozens of things where I'm a UI. I've got dozens of things where I'm a CI. I've got dozens of things where I'm a UC and a few things that I'm a CC and so do you. So this is not about a reflection on us. It's a reflection on what we're trying to master. So whenever we try something out for the first time, we're at UI. The brain is off because it doesn't know it. The hand is off because it's never done it. UI, unconscious incompetence, which is a fancy way of saying, I don't know how badly I'm gonna be at this. I don't know why I suck. My example here for me right now would be, well, certainly snowboarding, would be a, tu would be a tuba, playing the tuba. I've never played the tuba, never held a tuba. I know what it is, but let's say I love the sound of the tuba so much, I decide one day I'm gonna sign up for a tuba lesson. So go down to my local high school where there's a tuba instructor and I pay my 20 bucks for my first half hour tuba lesson. At that moment, I'm UI. And that's why that woman is smiling because it's a good feeling. It's a feeling of excitement, enthusiasm, hope. I can't wait to get started. But then I'm handed a tuba, boom. Oh my God, is this heavy. This is a lot heavier than I thought it was. And man, I'm, it's hard for me to get my hand around till I can touch the valves and whoa. I can't even make a noise out of this thing. I need so much air in my lungs. This is very difficult physically. I don't even know what I'm doing. And just like that, within moments of holding the tuba, I have slipped into the second quadrant of mastery, CI, consciously incompetent. What does that mean? It means my brain just turned on. My brain just went, this is heavy. My brain just went, I don't know what I'm doing. The brain just went, what do these valves do? The brain went, that takes a lot of air in my lungs. The brain is on in its journey to learn. My hand, it's as dead as it was when I started. In fact, that CI, it's exactly where I was at the snowboarding lesson. My brain was telling me how bad I was. The beginning of UI, unconsciously incompetent. I don't know how bad I am. That's why I'm happy. But then I take my first lesson and then the frustration comes. CI, I know exactly why I stink. And guess what, guys? That happens to be the quadrant, the second quadrant, where adults abandon learning. Just like I did at lunch when I decided to go back to skiing. That's where the ego doesn't like it. You beat yourself up. This is hard. This is impossible. This isn't worth it. I don't like this. This isn't fun. Whenever you have those moments going, I'm trying to get my hand to do something and it won't. See, I. But for my son, who was also in CI, he wasn't steaming out of the ears because my son lives in CI all day. We all live in CI all day when we're children because we're always faced with the, oh, I get it, I still can't do it yet. And the trick to mastery is how do we bridge to the next quadrant? That next quadrant there says, you see, unconsciously competent. This is what happened if I decided to stick with the tuba, or if I wanted to stick with snowboarding. And you've all experienced this. You're beating yourself up, this is horrible, I stink, I don't know why this is so hard, I can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. But for whatever reason, either by desire or by command of someone else, I gotta stick with it. So I stick in that lousy snowboard lesson the next day, and maybe the day after. I come back next week and grab that heavy tuba again. No smiles, but here I am in spite of my brain reminding me how bad I am. And then guess what magically happens? You can't predict it, you can't plan for it, but 
All of a sudden, you make a move on the snowboard. Little one, but it happened. Or you actually blow the note in key on the tuba. Mm. Well, we just, that was correct. I have no idea how I did that. I could not repeat it, and I could never explain it. But it happened, it's undeniable. I made a call, I carved a bit on my snowboard. I blew a note or two on the tuba, and then all of a sudden I suck again at the tuba. And all of a sudden I've fallen on my butt on snowboarding again, but you can't deny that the moment didn't happen. The moment did happen, why? Because my, uh, my, my hand started to learn it. My brain was out, my brain had, was out at CI. But because I was continuing the activity, my hand had a chance to learn it. The hand doesn't learn at the same pace as the brain. It learns differently. There are millions of studies that show us this. In fact, I'd argue the only thing keeping me from learning the snowboard or the scuba, uh, excuse me, the tuba, was my brain. Even though it felt like it was my hand that was causing me significant problems, it was my brain that was telling me I couldn't do it, which was keeping me from the actual practice. That's what practice is for. Think back to when you were in a kid and maybe played sports. Think back to practice. I don't care if you play lacrosse or soccer or football, wrestling, field hockey, whatever. I bet your coach had a whistle. Tweet. And everybody knows who's ever done a sport, when you hear the coach tweet, what do you do? You freeze. You stop doing whatever you're doing. There's going to be a command, there's gonna be instruction, but whatever it is, you stop. Tweet, do it again, yells the coach. Tweet, nope, do it again, yells the coach. You know what he's doing or she's doing? That tweet is to tell your brain, shut up. Hand does it again. Hand does it again. You ever, you ever remember that loud mouth in practice? Why are we doing this, coach? This doesn't make any sense. And then the coach says, I don't know. Why don't we all take laps while we can think about it? And everyone grimaces going, thanks a lot, man. And that'll be the last time he ever raises his hand during practice. You don't get to talk during practice, do you? You have to do. Practice is not talking. Practice is practice. So back to this third quadrant, you see unconscious competency. That moment on the snowboard, I actually carved. I actually went down a little bit. Uh, the moment with the tube, I blew a few notes. My hand competency turned on, but my brain unconsciousness stayed off. The first quadrant, I don't know why I suck. Second quadrant, I know exactly why I suck. That's why we bail. Third quadrant, I don't know how I just did it. I don't know how I just did it. We all have places where we have that beautiful UC. Look how happy those three folks are in the graphic. I did this graphic myself, by the way, in Canva. And I'm telling you this because I did these four little squares to get to use Canva so it looks like a decent graphic. I'm like, I don't need to hire anyone. I can do this myself. No problem, UI. Then I open up Canva. Oh my God, what does the template mean? How do I change the color? Oh, I think I just deleted the whole damn thing. I hate this, CI. But I had to get this done for Tuesdays with Hoffman. I didn't have a choice. So I kept working and working and working and frustrated and frustrated and all of a sudden I'm moving things right. I'm locking things in the grid. I'm saving it right. I found the right color. I don't even know how I did that. You see? For me in life, shooting pool, you see. I can't tell you why I'm any good at it, but I'm awesome at it. I am, I don't know why, I'm like a savant. That's what the savant is. He or she doesn't even know how good they are. Now I told you earlier that I kind of borrowed some of this. Many of you have probably seen this. A friend of mine who's joining us, hey Chip, joining us he sees this in a pyramid uh, of growth of mastery, same idea. But wherever I've seen this before, the CC and the UC are inverted. The idea is that the UC, unconscious competency, it's so deliriously wonderful, I don't even know why I'm good at this, I just am, that it's elevated in our minds to the pinnacle of mastery, but I disagree. This is where I have some authorship, I disagree. Because I got turned on to Buddhism about 12 years ago and it changed everything about how I looked at things. And it can't possibly be the peak of mastery if I'm not mindful. And that's what UC is. UC is fun and glorious. And by the way, CI, second quadrant, that's when all of us as adults bail. UC, I don't know how good I am, but I am. That's where children bail. You don't believe me? My youngest son is doing his math homework. He says, I'm all done, but I'm all done, Dad. I say, oh yeah, great, can I see it? Well, why do you need to see it? Bing, 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 as soon as I get any kind of rhythm on why can't I see my homework, I know he didn't finish it. 
What do you need to see it? Just show me. Shows me the, the, the paper. First page is done. It's geometry. Second page is blank. I said, what was, what was the assignment, buddy? Just do it until you felt like stopping? No, no, no. I had to do the whole thing, but I got it. I got it. He got it because he got the first five or six questions right. So he got it. That's how children think. Okay, now my brain, I got it. It doesn't matter that my brain doesn't know. See, that's where kids will bail. But wherever you slice it, you see feels good. I'm good at it shooting pool. And I'm sure you have a lot of things that you don't know why you're good at it, but you are. And it's fun. But just because you're good at it, and if you don't know why, unconsciously, unconsciously competent, you're not really mastering it. See, unconsciously competent, competent means I don't know why I'm good at it. But you stick with that tuba. You stick with snowboarding. You stick with geometry. You stick with shooting pool. At the UC place where you're already happy and you're already joyous, but now your hand is mastered and your brain is now analyzing and adopting and feeling what your hand is doing and your brain starts to notice. Oh, you know what, Jeff? You're a little stronger on your right hand when you bring the cue back. In fact, you're a little too strong. Why don't you practice with the left hand just so you can get a better sense of touch? That would be something only a UC to CC would, would experience. Consciously competent. I know why I'm good. And that is mastery, isn't it? I know exactly why I'm good at it. I, I am 100% a tuba player at UI. That's me. I've never held one. UI, no problem. CI is me. It's snowboarding. You see, well, that's me shooting pool. CC, for me, that's public speaking. I am, I mastered public speaking. I don't mean that with any hubris other than honesty. I'm not only really great at public speaking, I know exactly why I'm great at it. That doesn't happen overnight. That happens with great dedication and great practice. But if I wanted to swap out public speaking for the tuba, I have a roadmap. It's this one right here. So what's the, what's the takeaway? The takeaway is this. If you are struggling with something, and that could be anything from objection handling to making a good Zoom call, to writing emails, to your closing techniques, to negotiation, to the tens of thousands of other things that have nothing to do with sales. If there's something you really wanna do and you're struggling, take a look at this and ask yourself, where am I? And if you find yourself in the CI box or bubble, there's one cure, and that's to shut off your brain. Find practice. See, I've never believed that change is something that happens with time. I believe, something, I believe change happens with frequency. How long does it take to get good at something? I don't know. How many times in a row do you plan on practicing it? You see, the, the, the hand doesn't know hours. The hand doesn't know weeks. The hand doesn't know quotas. The hand doesn't know a calendar. The hand knows repetition. The question you have to ask yourself is, do I have the stomach to be the way my kid was when he was snowboarding? Do you have the stomach when you're at something that you're trying to get better at and you're frustrated? Do you have something in you that says to yourself, I'll try that again. I'll try that again. Let's jump off the, uh, the graphic for a minute there, Sean. Let me see if we've got some questions. All right, cool. I'm, I love talking about this. We have a few minutes. So let's see what we got here. Any questions here? Melissa's mentioning about the direction of mindfulness. That's it. That's why I've swapped the two, Melissa, because I think if you end it at UC, there's so many of these that end at UC is the top of the pyramid because look how great and effortless it is. But I don't buy it because I was UC of public speaking a long time ago. I was, I've been good at it for a while. But now that I know why I'm good at it, oh, it's a game changer. Put it this way. I'll put it this way. I'll, in real world. For 20 years, I've been teaching sales training in largely eight and four hour sessions. And many of you who've known me for a while, that's how you met me. You met me at your corporate event or something where I was doing a live training. Sometimes it'd be two hours, sometimes it'd be four hours, sometimes it'd be eight hours. And then COVID hit. And say goodbye to eight hour and four hour and two hour trainings. Who's gonna sit in front of their camera or sit in front of a computer and watch two hours of this stuff? Give me a break. You aren't and neither am I which is why I realized we had to make a big change at our company and it meant we were gonna change our video length and it was gonna change our training length. Right now, every training we do is one minute, three minutes, and 30. Because that's all I think anyone can stomach. But I had to rewrite all this and deliver it in a strange new way. If I was still UC at public speaking, I wouldn't have gotten here. I wouldn't have gotten here because I was like, oh, my brain was off on the eight hour session. 
Luckily, my brain wasn't off at the eight hours. I knew why I was good at eight hours. I knew why I was good at four hours. I knew why I was good at two hours. I could take my brain and start to practice what a one minute world is, what a three minute world is, what a 30 minute world is. And thank goodness, because I wouldn't have a business right now if I didn't take that on. But three years ago, I never done one of these. Thank goodness for this mastery matrix that I could use as guide. Let's see a couple other questions here. Mr. Miyagi wisdom, you got that right, Estelle. That's right. From my good friend Chip, is it always effective to know why you're good at something? Isn't you seem more effective sometimes? So I guess, you know, the question really, excuse me, the question really is what do we mean by effective? So I know that I'm taking a, a, a different position here because I know in the West, you see is the pinnacle. It's sexy. We like it. We like the idea of someone effortlessly being a master at something. We love it. But the Eastern part of the globe sees the world differently. That if you are that good at something with your brain off, are you truly engaged? Are you truly alive? Because the only moment we have is the one that I'm and you are having right now. So being presence of mind and being organic and being mindful, that's where the joy of life happens. I can't tell you, and you know it too, guys. You guys have your CCs. Literally and figuratively. You know exactly what that CC feels like. And when you are that in command of something, you get that seeing around corners feeling. Everything seems to slow down because you know what's happening next. It happens with me in negotiation all the time. I can anticipate before the words leave her lips what that procurement person's gonna say in this moment. Why? Because I have conscious competency in negotiation. So I do agree, Chip, that the there is a sexiness and a and a short you know, order to get to mastery in that UC, but man, push it. Push your brain to catch up with your hand. So your hand had to catch up with your brain to learn it. Now let your brain catch up with your hand to master it. Great question. Uh, let's see, a couple more. Tony, seems that if you're seeking to progress, there is a back and forth between CI and UC before you get to CC. Yeah, you know, there is. It's not, you know, it's not like a complete rocket ship there. You flirt around a little, and, and I know we've all typically that UCCI, right? You have a moment of brilliance and then you doubt yourself because you suck. I mean, that, that's a big part there. That little strip between the second and the third paradigm parts of this uh, quadrant, always go to practice. Always go to practice. Here's the example I'll give. So I'm, I'm a big golfer. And I had golf lessons once where um, I'm on the tee, I'm on a, you know, a, a practice green, and uh, I, I hit the ball and I slice it. Now, if you know anything about golf, if you're a right-handed golfer, that would mean that as soon as the ball leaves, hits the club face, it makes this horrible right angle uh, in flight. If you're lefty, it's the other way. Um, and if it, if, if it becomes part of your game, it will ruin your game. You'll, you'll literally, there are people who I know who don't play golf anymore because of a slice. So slicing is terrible. And I don't slice generally, but I'm learning a new technique and all of a sudden I slice the ball. Hmm. Then I do it again, I slice it again. Hmm. And I'm looking at it going, hmm. Right away my, I'm like, oh, what's this? Right away my trainer goes, Jeff, put your head down, don't look up. I'll just hit the golf balls. I'll team up for you. Hit a golf ball, boom. Hit a golf ball, boom. I'm, not, I'm finishing the swing, but I'm not looking where the golf ball goes. I have no idea if I'm slicing or not. He's teeing it up for me. He did this for a while. Then afterwards, he said, all right, go back and do what you're doing. I go back, slice is gone. What happened? What happened was smart. What happened was my coach got my brain out of the equation. You see, if you focus on what you do wrong too much, your brain then institutionalizes it and you'll never get past it. You'll be in CI forever. But so instead of me paying close attention to failure, how about just play close attention to the hand and the practice that we're doing? So yeah, I think practice is really the way to get through this. Ooh, big question here from Tana. Oh, and Anna too. How do we gather feedback on how or why we're good at something without asking others, tell me why I'm fantastic? Oh, that's so awesome, Anna. Um, but heck, you've watched enough of these to know. I, is there anything more endearing than asking that question? Because typically when we ask it, it's because we slipped into, C into UC. See, we suck, we suck, we suck, we suck, and all of a sudden we got it right. That's exactly, Anna, when you ask your friends and family, okay, what did I do right here? Because I normally can't play the tuba and I just played two notes in a row. So what did I do? What did you see me do that was different? That is an, that's a very endearing thing to ask, and you're asking someone to be included in your learning process. So I know you feel like, oh, that seems like it could be a lot of, could be egotistical. It isn't, particularly when you're doing it off the heels of CI. Let me take Tanner's big one. How do you stay patient? Amen to that. I imagine your son and your progression through learning how to snowboarding went different paces through the matrix uh, for the same skill. Very true. How do we do this while around us may be more successful? Um, 
hard for me to know to do it since my job really depends upon it. Well, that's great, Tanner. I, I get that. Um, you know, my thinking is embrace the incompetence. Not the unconsciousness, the incompetence. What does that mean? It means dedicate time for practice. As adults, what happens is we learn a new cold calling technique. It makes perfect sense. Maybe you heard it from me and Cece. Makes perfect sense. You leave Tuesdays with Hoffman, you jump on the phone and try it, and it fails. You go, well, this sucks, I'll never do this again. Why not change the whole rhythm here, Tanner? Instead of saying, okay, I'm gonna try this technique I just learned in a real live moment, why don't I scrimmage? Why don't I practice? The answer to you, Tanner, is the answer I'll give to everybody because it's what I do. It's what CC does. There is time in my calendar for practice. Blocks of time for practice. The only thing that's going on is practicing something I'm trying to get better at. Maybe it's a sales technique. Maybe it's a speaking technique. Maybe it's something personal. And when, I in, when I'm in that window, I'm not, there's no judgment. Maybe I'm in that window alone, and maybe I'm in that window with a coach. And a coach doesn't always have to be a master. A coach can be a friend. A coach can be a peer. So if I'm going to learn something from my, if my manager says to me, we're doing something brand new we've never done before. I know we're almost up against it. I want to do something brand new we've never done before. My answer to that manager is, okay, when do we get practice time so I can screw this up royally as I learn it? That's my answer to you, Tanner. So look at that. We blasted through that half hour pretty quick and no records. This is just, I had to chew up all the real estate I had. But um, so check it out. I hope you like this and I hope you share it with you. We're gonna, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Kendall to put in the chat the link to our YouTube channel. I'm gonna post this here. And uh, if you think you have friends or family that'd be curious about it, you know, send them, send them to our YouTube channel. Uh, uh, this, this, this really changed my, perspec my perspective of myself, my own capabilities. And when I saw it, being uh, exercised with my children, it was so delightful. And knowing that they have a tool in their pocket that gets them off of the frustration square so it frees them to actually pursue the things they're curious about and really want to do, what a gift that is. So, whew! So, so see, yeah, careful what you wish for when CC leaves. Um, uh, we're, we're back to business next week, guys, at Tuesdays with Hoffman. CC will be back, uh, and nice and tan, I'm assuming. And uh, we will have our last episode for the season. So you don't want to miss it. We're going to do some Q&A. We're going to have some fun stuff we're going to talk about, including some things we've seen the last couple weeks. Some lousy layoffs have been going on. We're going to talk about that as we wrap up our season. So I hope you join us then. I hope you got something out of this. I love sharing it. Thanks for joining. Happy selling, everybody.